Up next, we have a surprise guest, Steve Delahanty, the refuge manager for the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, who has so kindly offered to talk to us about contaminants. Um, I, will, uh, I will do my best, and I am delighted to be here. Um, again, my name is Steve Delahanty, and I'm the refuge manager for Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. So I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm in Homer but I am having a great week here in Unalaska. And, uh, whoops, and it looks like I just fell down on the screen. Uh, so, I am doing a little bit of a pinch hit. I didn't know I was doing this until uh, a few hours ago, and, uh, and so you're gonna, you're gonna get the best I can give you. But um, I'm gonna give you one preface. I'm gonna talk about contaminants issues on, on the, the refuge, but you have to understand there, uh, it's really a very, very technical field, and I am not a contaminants um, scientist. We have a, 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 a wonderful employee, uh, Tim Plazinski is, is his name. He works for the refuge in Anchorage, and he actually understands this stuff and the chemistry and things that I don't, uh, frankly, have that technical knowledge of. So if there's a, if there's a uh, high-end question, I may have to punt a little bit. So... I'm going to start with a little bit of a reminder. Um, Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge is this real spread out place all across coastal Alaska from southeast uh, down along the British Columbia border through the Gulf of, of Alaska and the, along the peninsula, the Aleutian chain where we are now and, and on, up, uh, on up north. So it's, it's uh, these federal lands and I think of it, of course, as a home for wildlife. There are hundreds of thousands of marine mammals that, um, that, uh, that use these refuge lands. And most famously, seabirds, uh, Alaska Maritime Refuge, and, and, and this area that we are, in which we're spending time right now is really globally significant uh, place for wildlife, about 40 million seabirds nest on Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge along with lots of waterfowl and songbirds and, and uh, wonderful plants and, uh, uh, and other, other creatures. But it's also a home for people. And that's something that, that I try and remember all the time. It's home for people today uh, that, that uh, you know, what this area that I think of as, as wildlife refuge, of course, is home for, for many of you. And, uh, and it's your backyard and it's your place, as we heard from, from Orville and have heard from other people, it's a place where people make a living, whether that's subsistence or, or the associated uh, offshore waters and commercial fishing and things like that. And it's been home to people for a long, long time, for thousands of years, as we heard from Ginny. But uh, a recent period of intense human activity in the Aleutians relates to World War II and the Cold War period following World War II, and that had a big effect on, on the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. So I just wanted to talk about uh, a couple of those associated problems that resulted from the, from the World War II activities. I mean, we shouldn't forget that despite all the, the terrible things that happened related to the war, it was this critical national defense needs for the, for the nation and the Cold War response too. So, you know, I, we need to sort of honor all sides of that. Um, but nonetheless, all that activity did lead to, to uh, not only the uh, the rats that Martin was talking about, Martin Renner was talking about, but also uh, various types of contamination. I'm going to talk very, very quickly about the first two things there, um, and then just a little bit more about the third one, the formerly used defense sites. So uh, I'm sure there are people in the room that know more about this than I do, but for, the, for those who are unfamiliar with it, the, the Navy for many years has been involved with cleanup on, on Adak Island. It isn't really directly a National Wildlife Refuge thing because the cleanup is occurring on the naval withdrawal lands. It's not, uh, at least a lot of it is occurring on that land, not on, uh, not on federally uh, designated wildlife refuge lands, not on Aleut Corporation lands, but on this land that's still under the control of the Department of Defense because it's because it's dirty and it can't go elsewhere until it's been cleaned up. So uh, that has been going on for years and years. 
On Amchitka Island, there are two important things going on on Amchitka. Uh, one relates to the Department of Energy's legacy management. Amchitka was used as an underground nuclear test site, and, uh, and there were several uh, nuclear detonations done deep, deep, deep underground there. And so uh, roughly every five years, the Department of Energy goes back to Amchitka and, and basically checks to make sure that everything is secure there. And uh, the other part of the cleanup on Amchitka relates to, to uh, naval facilities and a cleanup that occurred on Amchitka, or kind of partial cleanup that occurred on Amchitka many years ago where the, the, the uh, debris associated with it wasn't removed from the island but was rather put in a, in a special repository that is designed not to leak uh, the you know, PCBs and things like that out of the site, but uh, uh, the large earthquake occurred uh, out in the Western Aleutians, as you remember, a couple of years ago. I think it was 7.9 magnitude. It was a big earthquake. I was on ADAC at the time, and, and I don't ever need to feel a stronger one. I know that. Uh, and, and there was some um, damage to the, to the um, um, mud pit caps that overlay these, these deposits. And so they are actually out on Amchitka right now as we are here, um, just checking to make sure that everything is okay on Amchitka. Uh, but mostly what, uh, what I know a little bit more about is the, the cleanup work on the, on the formerly used defense sites or FUDs sites. They are scattered across uh, various parts of Alaska, including a whole lot of them, as you can see on the slide, that are, that are out here in this part of the world. And uh, uh, there are dozens of these sites that are associated with Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. The Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, is, is, the, is in the lead for doing the cleanup. And uh, we have Recently, thanks to Tim Plazinski, this contaminants expert, we finally have the people who can kind of speak the language. I was having a real hard time being effective in this for several years because I was thinking about, I was thinking about biology and, and refuge management and, and people, and they're thinking about technical contamination and, and Superfund rules and things. I just, we just didn't speak the same language, but, but uh, we have a much, much better relationship with them now. They, are, they really set the priorities on where they go uh, to do these cleanups. And uh, typically they're, they're, um, they're worried about a lot of uh, old drum deposits and things like that, including um, also uh, uh, above ground tank leakage. Some of these areas are, are pretty gross, like you can see there where that's uh, petroleum deposits coming out of that, out of, uh, out of tanks and then also things like batteries and so on. And uh, right now in 2016, the, the, the Corps hired a contractor to go to Attu. That was one of their uh, priority sites that they identified. And so they were in the, um, the Massacre Bay area on Attu. There was no, um, no real thought, at least initially, of trying to clean up every single point of potential debris on Attu for example, it's, it's huge and there's, you know, unexploded ordnance and things like that scattered all over what we really wanted. And we're concerned about the, the, the cultural resources, both those thousands of year old sites, but also the, the nation's memory of World War II battlefield sites. So trying to figure out what is trash and what is treasure is a part of the whole uh, effort. And so uh, they really focused on what, what were the most egregious deposits, these tar pits where you've got active, um, active leaking going on and gross soil contamination and contamination of waterways. So they were, um, they were out there in 2016. They will be back again with a, a major effort to complete that work in the Massacre Bay area in 2017 on Attu. These are just a few uh, slides of that kind of work. They also have as a priority um, uh, Kiska Island which I think will be uh, very uh, challenging again because there's so much uh, cultural history there and we want to make sure that we don't damage the cultural resources yet still clean up the real uh, serious contaminants problems. And, uh, 
And one thing that, uh, and then a, another priority I know that they're just going to begin the investigative stage for is Great Sitkin Island, which has a huge network of fuel tanks and fuel lines, which Tim Plazinski, this uh, employee who I said speaks the language, he recognized as, uh, as a very serious threat because there is pr probably a great deal of fuel still in these tanks and lines. It's been there for 70 years now, and if, uh, if they ruptured, we could have a, you know, a spill, a release directly into the streams and into the ocean. So we are very eager to have them go and at least remove the fuels from that great Sitkin site. But as you saw in that earlier slide, there are, there are dozens and dozens of, slight, of sites across, uh, across the Aleutians and across Alaska, and it is a long, long-term project. But that's just a little bit uh, about uh, the contaminants cleanup. The FUDS is very active. Corps of Engineers is in the lead. The Department of Energy has the lead on, on Amchitka Island for that long-term legacy for the nuclear testing. And then the Navy has some activity as well. So we play, the, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service plays more of a coordination role, frankly, than, than anything else. Uh, so that's all I have for you. I wanted to keep it short and snappy. And if somebody has a question and there's time, I'd welcome it.